So ask yourself, are you a person that has needed someone to change the circumstances like someone to love us? Half the people in America who are single hate being single because of how other people perceive them as being single. Oh, you're 35 and single? Oh. <laughs> now, where I grew up in West Virginia, if you were over 25 and single, he's gay. <laughs> Why is he gay? Well, he's 25, he's not married. I mean, that's the stupidity, right? Or what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? What's wrong with you? 30 years old, not married? Well, maybe I don't want to be married. Maybe I like waking up to my own breath and not someone else's. <laughs> maybe I like the way I feel. Maybe I'd rather cuddle my dog than someone else. Should I have that right? Not in our society. We have very strict standards about what we will accept in people and what we won't. Even today, the only reason you can be single and over 30 is if you're a career. Oh, well, that, that, they've got a career. Career comes first. They're working hard in their career. Of course they should be single. What if they just don't want someone else in their life? Who says you've got to have someone in your life? Well, gee, Gary, if you don't have anyone in your life, how are you going to feel bonded? How are you going to feel connected? How are you going to feel loved? How are you going to feel appreciated? What are you, who are you going to talk to about your problems? Who are you going to share those special moments with? Well, I know a lot of people who don't share a lot of special moments. For the moments they share that are not special, it's about 90%. The special moments they recall when they're trying to reconcile or decide if they no longer want the relationship. We have a terror of being alone because we immediately equate alone with loneliness. So immediately we have to fill that with someone. So we try to match a resume with our resume, but it never works because resumes are not people. We're not matching energies. What would happen, what would change if instead of needing someone to love you, you took the time to respect all the reasons that you are lovable. And how do you manifest your love for self and others? Because if you can't love yourself, how in the world are you going to love anyone else? And if you do love yourself, then how are you going to manifest this towards other people? Is it going to be exclusively, I love you, but I can't love her? Why not? Well, exclusivity, territoriality, conventionality. Well, what if I want to love everybody? We well, can't do that, Gary. Well, yes, I can. I can do anything I want. Well, no, you can't. You can't do that and be accepted, so I'm not accepted. Where is it written that love is exclusive? If I can't love, then that means I'm going to show prejudice. I'm going to allow people to suffer and die. I'm going to allow harm in societies. I'm going to allow racism and bigotry. I'm going to allow human suffering in South Africa for all these years until it became politically important to focus on it. But I remember going to Washington protesting in front of the South African Embassy when there were no photographies, when get a photo session to show how liberal they were, right? When there's a photo opportunity to prove their political liberalness, they're there. But what about all the times they were doing business and their lobbyists were, who were giving them PAC money were doing business with South Africa and racist regimes? Did they challenge that? You bet they did not. They're such hypocrites. But then again, I, I hate all politicians. <laughs> I don't respect any of them because I don't believe in the political process. I believe that it's philosophically and spiritually corrupt. The word hate is not the right word. I don't respect them. I don't respect them because I see that they're not honest to any value. First, you never know whose value they're seeking to honor theirs or a Packer special interest group. When I find that lobbyists sit in on committee uh, meetings and get their agenda written into the statutes, and then the politicians go forward as if they're doing us a favor by something they pass that we don't need but someone else does, that's not honest. The whole system is permeated like that. And if you doubt me, then ask, ask this. When was the last time that a bus driver got elected to a major office, or a secretary, or a dietitian, or a nutritionist? When? No. It takes money and power and PAC groups and special interests. Well, if that's what the whole system is, then who's serving the needs of individuals? If a need happens to be broad enough to cover your interest, fine. But in many cases, it does not work against us. Look at our environment. Look at the quality of our food. Look at the quality of our health care. Look at the stupid and inhumane uh, and highly racist wars that we participate in. 
Just look around, but you see when you start looking that close, it looks very ugly. You know, it's like getting down and looking up someone's nose. You may not like what you see. But when you look at the body politic, when you look at most institutions, what the institution really stands for and how they function, it doesn't look good. When you look at many relationships up close and for what they really are together for, they don't look that healthy. They frequently look like very insecure people trying to gain some sense of security through a bonding that's artificial and not spiritual with another human being. Well, show me a bond that's not based upon a spiritual connection, and I'll show you one that A, is dysfunctional, and B, is unhealthy, and C, is going to leave a lot of damage. And then most of the time, people are going to be participating in some effort to prove that they deserve to be in the relationship by compromising themselves to the other person's needs, either changing themselves or trying to get the other person to change. That's why I believe that we should ask basic questions of what do we want in the changing of our circumstances of our life, and if someone to love us, then it means we're not lovable for who we are. If I feel that I am loved because I love myself and I love life, therefore what I manifest itself is love. Therefore, I don't have to give my love exclusively to white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from West Virginia. I don't have to give it exclusively to people who are rich or powerful, educated. I can give it to everyone. Therefore, there is no barrier to my love. And yet in our society, I am appalled by what I see. People that we respect, that we call loving people, and they're very exclusive from where they give their so-called love. Then it can't be love they're giving, can it? Because real love knows no boundaries. Real love loves everybody. If you're black, white, rich, or poor. But in our society, I don't see the rich liking the poor. When was the last time you saw rich people associating with poor people? Educated associating with non-educated? Thanksgiving Day is the only time, and that's out of guilt and photo opportunity. <laughs> Gee, I've been a schmuck all year. Let me get down and serve some turkey to some poor people and get the hell out of here quick. <laughs> it's, all, it's all game. But only a child could see it as a game because the child is not afraid of the consequences of saying what they feel. But we as adults are more concerned about that. Now, someone to make us secure. Who's going to make you secure? Who? Huh? Who? <laughs> Your husband, of course, you see? That's the reason to get married to a powerful person. They can always make you, I'll take care of you, honey. Right? Real bad thoughts. Who else makes you secure? Experts. Experts, you bet. Good, good concept. Experts make us secure because they give us confidence. And what creates the confidence that an expert gives us versus someone who's not an expert? Illusion like, uh, an illusion created by, uh, like, say, uniforms. A uniform gives you a sense of authority. Like a, a institution. An institution, big institutions. We like big institutions with great facades because then we have confidence that anyone who could afford to build such a big, powerful building and have such rich people and powerful people working in it whose names are in the paper we've recognized, we must have to have confidence they know what they're doing. Who in America knows what they're doing who's an expert? I don't know many experts. I see a lot of nutritionists who are not healthy. I see a lot of holistic doctors who are fat and overweight and greedy. I don't see a lot of the real experts. If we've got experts, why are we in debt to a four or five trillion dollars and bankrupt as a nation? I don't see the experts. We have experts on cancer. Why are we losing 650,000 people this year to cancer? Experts on heart disease. Why are we going to have a million heart attacks and end up with half of them ending up people dead? The very person who's going to tell you they can deal with your heart is going to give you a basic for food group that's going to create heart disease. Now, isn't that ironic? They're going to tell you what to do to create the disease. Then you're going to go in and be treated by them. And then they're going to give you a coronary bypass operation which will not cure your heart disease. And yet you'll continue to believe in them and go to them before you go get chelation therapy. Now, therefore, it's not the doctor to blame. It's your belief system. Because your belief system doesn't even want to trust in a different mindset and a different way of knowing. The people that we think will make us secure we pay the price of the control out of our life. 
I've never met a person who will guarantee us security that doesn't also demand our power. Nobody's going to create security for you, even the illusion of security, unless you get the payback to them. And therefore, if someone's needing to give us security, then they can't be giving us love. Because anyone who's telling us they're going to make us secure, it's not love that's making us secure. Because if you have unconditional love of self, then you've got security. And if you don't, then you have no security. So one of the ways I see whether a person is manifesting love is, are they secure enough to make the decisions on their own, educate themselves, and go through the process of cause and effect to see what will work or not work? It takes a lot of courage in our society to find the strength to be the expert in your own life, especially when we have allowed only selective guilds and groups and unions of people to call themselves experts. And if you're not a part of that, you're out of the loop. And if you are a part of it and you change the rules by giving answers that the group does not agree should be given that could disempower, make anyone else look bad, you're thrown out of the group. As a result, any doctor using techniques that are holistic, herbs, homeopathy, vitamins, vitamin C drips, those people are automatically excluded. They're thrown out. Hospitals don't want them. Insurance companies won't touch them. They can't get published. They are not invited to speak. They're excluded. Now, common sense would say that if a doctor is equally trained with all other doctors and they have the same ability to practice health care or sickness maintenance, and if they've taken a step beyond, then that's the person at least that's gone the extra step that has the additional knowledge. We, on the other hand, will say if you've taken the extra step, somehow it's regressed you intellectually and creatively, and we now are fearful of you just by the word quack, pseudoscientific, and, uh, and we will exclude them. That's not, a, that's not a challenge against the doctors. It's a challenge against all the people who are going ahead and believing in the orthodoxy in its limited perspective that doesn't have the answers with all of its experts that can't solve any of the problems of our society. What problem in our society has been solved? What, crime, drug addiction, children abuse, spousal abuse, theft, lying, deceit, corruption? What problem have all these experts solved? Give me one problem they've solved. Cancer, heart disease, mental illness, environmental contamination, all solvable, but not with these experts because they're using the same mind that created the problem to solve it. And therefore, they're not going to challenge themselves to where their self-esteem would be affected. And since self-esteem in our society is an artificial construct based upon the power, the privilege, prestige that you have gained, your knowledge, then those are what you put out in front of you saying, better respect me, I'm an expert. Look at my knowledge, my standing in the community. Look at what uh, I'm, I'm given in money. Would I be given this much money and access and exclusivity if I weren't the person with the answers? So we trust in the televangelist, Jimmy Swaggart, and we trust in the CEO of a company. Do you think any of these people outside of the megalomaniac give a hoot about us? Not one second. The very people who run our lives are the last people in the world who had, should have anything to do with our lives because they are inherently selfish and anyone can see it. Well, if we can all see it, then why don't we choose otherwise? So the problem is not these megalomaniacs running our lives, the power brokers. It's not the institutions that have been so self-centered that they only exist for their own perpetuation. It's us. And it gets back to the basics. And these are the basics. Someone whose strength exceeds our own. This couple that did outstanding this year did you ever think before you started this that you wouldn't have had the strength to be a, an athlete and win all these races and do this well? You had that confidence you could do it. Good. Did you? Good. Because the only way you could have done it is have that confidence. Where did the confidence come from? Inside. It didn't come from outside. And it didn't come from winning races. Because you had to have the confidence before you won the race. The race winning it was merely a consequence of that constant. It wasn't the object, nor was it the reward. It was just part of the process. But I'm sure that anything you did in your life that you put that energy into, it would manifest in the same way. You don't hold back at whatever you focus on. 
and you give it the interdisciplinary balance that it needs, and you do it in a way that's probably balanced and reflective of the rest of your life, right? Now, mind you, you could physically train someone to be equal as a champion, but if in the training of that person to be a champion, they imbalanced their lives, became obsessive and possessed by the need to win, yes, they could win, but it would be a hollow victory because it would not have engaged the process of growth. It would have just been goals. Now, our society focuses on goals, not process. As a result, whoever has the most rewards and biggest money maker, those are the people we praise. Look at the Fortune 500. We sanctify these people. Do you know a single person on the Fortune 500 that you'd want to be? Would you want to be Donald Trump? Huh? We make the mistake of looking at what a person accomplishes instead of looking at the person. And I know people who've never had an award and never won anything who have more character, more spiritual connectedness, more humility, more giving, and more grace in their being than all those Fortune 500 megalomaniacs put together. But no one's going to find them of interest because they're not the ones who are exhibitionistic. How much of what we do in our life is based upon our need to exhibit our self-esteem publicly, that we feel insecure when the public's not paying attention to us and praising us? That's the problem. So when it comes time to look for someone whose strength exceeds your own, no one's strength should exceed your own. No one's. You should be the strongest person in your life. And if you're not, then it's, it's an issue that you must face. Because I've never met a person who couldn't be strong. Someone we can confide in. Why do we need to confide in people? How do we normally confide in people? How? Hmm? Call them, up on the telephone. Call them up on the telephone. What do we do when we confide in people m most of the time? Being not in one person. All right. What else do we do? Huh? Gossip. Complain. Talk about our problems. Reveal something about yourself. What if you didn't have any need to do this? What if you didn't need anyone else's feedback about how you're going to feel about yourself by doing something? What if the confidence you have in self is a proclamation? So instead of confiding in people, you first confide so thoroughly in yourself that you're absolutely determined that whatever you're going to do, you're going to do it, and you're going to be happy with it. Then you become the center of your own life. Otherwise, do you know what happens? If you don't really have a sense of self that you are happy with, every time an important decision comes in your life, you're going to look for someone else to validate it. No one else can ever feel what you're feeling, know what you're experiencing, or see with your psyche. So by being a friend or confident, they'll give you assurances, but it's a false assurance. It has nothing to do with your reality. You alone have to control your own reality. So what if instead, you simply would make proclamations. You're going to do something, all right? And you say to the person, watch me do it. Now, you've committed yourself to something. Do you know what it's like when you commit yourself to something and you make no hesitation and you make no excuses? You simply say, I'm going to do something. Well, but, but, no buts, I'm going to do it. Well, you've got to give yourself a but. I mean, but what if, what if then you have an out? I want no outs. I'm going to unconditionally do something. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to achieve it, whatever it is. Think if you could do that, what would change in your life? What would be a few things that would change if you committed yourself to things and you absolutely unequivocally said you're going to do it? What would change? Everything. All right, everything. What else? Your commitment. Your commitment. Do you know what happens when you fully and unconditionally commit yourself to something? It becomes a priority in your life. No excuses. You're going to learn to change the process that allows you to achieve this. And that's what we need to do more of, much like you've done. By the way, many of you have done this when you started training for a marathon. You hadn't run a mile. 
and to know six months or a year away that you're going to do a marathon when you've never done one, when you've never run five miles, that took a lot of courage. But you couldn't do it mamsy pamsy. You couldn't say, well, you know, I mean, if, you know, I don't know if I can do it. I'll try. No. The moment people say they're trying, they're not doing it. You want to do something, you do it. If you don't want to do it, you say you're going to try. Commit yourself to something and stand behind your commitment. Someone to accept us as we are. Now, what does that say? that we're looking to change the circumstance of our life. If we are looking for someone to accept us as we are, then that means the circumstances are that we only have people in our life who are accepting us for who they need us to be. And that may not be who we really are. Only part might be who we are, and the other part may not. And we have to hide that or hold it in, because if they know who we really are, they may not reject us, might not want us. So it takes courage to say, this is who I am. This is the dynamic and totality. See, I'm a believer that you should lay out who you are completely, the best and the worst of your nature, your strengths and weaknesses, all that you are completely. Now, when you're that honest and you're that open and you're that vulnerable, then you focus on that which is empowering and positive. I believe that we spend too much of our time denying those energies that are not acceptable. Think of for women, think, in, think of if you were a woman in the 1920s and you were single and you liked men, right? You could be diagnosed, psychiatrically diagnosed, as having a mental illness because you were a threat to society. You would be a threat to all the married women and married men. So easy way to, to marginalize you as being empowered, we just say that that's a sickness. And we did. Women were institutionalized and giving drugs if they had a desire. So we've had a society that suppressed our desires. Well, the fact that we have desires that are repressed and hidden, partly because we're going to feel guilty if that desire does not in any way match our beliefs. If our self-esteem could be lowered by someone who would reject our desires, then you can believe the person's going to feel guilt about having even the desire, let alone ever manifesting. So we're a society highly repressed. Even what we think, what we do, what we feel is socially controlled. And you get someone who has an abandon that lives their life as they see it, that person is a danger to orthodox society and is almost always rejected or they are labeled. By labeling a person, you can then reject them or marginalize them. You never see anyone who lives life completely, honestly, and openly being promoted in our society. That person would be the biggest threat this society ever have. No institution could tolerate it. Conformity gets you ahead. So messages earlier in life about the power of conformity on children are easy. So think about who accepts you in your life. Do the people who accept you accept you for being all that you are or only the part that matches their needs? Because if they're only accepting you in part, you got some problems. Because then you got a fear that the person's ever going to know what you're completely about. Because that they may reject. I have friends of mine who I know have racist thoughts, but I can still hold them as a friend because they don't actualize those racist thoughts, but they were honest about it. And then I have friends who I know are racist, but will never acknowledge it. I've never met a person in my life who did not have bad thoughts, negative thoughts. That's not the problem. You can't stop negative thoughts from coming into your mind. What you can do is stop from acting on it. You don't have to give it power. You don't have to give it form. You don't have to give it a life force. So you can be selective in what you give your energy to. Better to be honest about all that you are, because otherwise you're going to be forever hiding and you know what you're going to be? You're going to be one of these people that overreact to everything because part of what you're going to overreact to is what you've repressed. Why do you think in our society we have such a problem with sexual, any form of uh, sexuality? That's what we lynch most people with in our society. That's what we try to disgrace and embarrass people by their sexuality. And the more open they are, the more prolific they are, the more we condemn them. Because as a nation, 
our own repressed sexuality then becomes focused on people who are expressing it and we condemn those people in order to exonerate our own repression. It's a very sick world when people can't even express or talk about what they're really feeling. And if you doubt me, then try to justify all the pornography that's purchased in a given year. It's the biggest single profitable business in the United States outside of drugs. Isn't it interesting in a so-called healthy society, gambling, drugs, and pornography are your three most profitable industries with over 85% of the population participating in it. That tells you something. And yet we won't even look at that. Because if we look at it, we try to have to analyze it and we'd have to share the, the blame around and institutions are not gonna allow it. So we're a big in denial. Individual denial, collective denial, group denial, couple denial, big time denial. Because what other people think of us becomes more important than what we really are. And look at, when was the last time you saw any politician who didn't try to use any weakness or perceived uh, deviance in any other uh, opponents to their advantage? Our whole campaigns now are negative campaigns. And so we, we look at all the negatives and we say, well, we want the person that seems less negative. That's ridiculous. Someone who's there when no one else will be. That means that we're frequently afraid of the process of being alone when we have problems to deal with. But that's exactly when you should be alone, when you have problems to deal with. Instead of being alone and going inside and trusting in our inner being that we can resolve problems, we immediately want to distract ourselves by connecting on the telephone, gossiping, uh, hounding people with our problems. And generally, that's not a person who's going to change any of their problems anyhow. They're just going to keep processing it.